Well, I'm Jessica Einhorn. I'm the Dean of SAIS. And on behalf of the University of Chicago and SAIS, I want to welcome all our special guests, the students, the faculty, and the members of our SAIS community and University of Chicago alumni. It's a great personal pleasure for me to welcome Hank Paulson back to the podium at SAIS. Our speaker and his topic today bring back fond memories of his time as distinguished visiting scholar and fellow of the Bernard Schwartz Forum on Constructive Capitalism. From January 2009 to June 2010, he was here. And indeed, I remember attending a class on China's financial system when Professor Botelier had the pleasure of introducing the famous Secretary Paulson to his class just months after he departed government. Hank Paulson has a concise CV, which connotes his passions and his steadfastness in business, philanthropy, service, and I'd add family to that list. As we witness the broad social movements, whose tagline is protest against Wall Street, but with a much broader set of grievances, it's a pleasure to introduce a banker who believed in the mission of capital markets to finance the great American market-based economy and led his firm as president and then CEO of Goldman Sachs for 12 years and a time when it was held in great esteem around the world. Coming out of Chicago to New York City, um, Hank Paulson, Hank to me, was then welcomed to Washington where he was sworn in to the office of Secretary of the Treasury by President George W. Bush in 2006. He stayed for the harrowing challenges of the financial crisis during the months of peril from Bear Stearns to Lehman and beyond. Hank came to SICE immediately following the transition in government the day after the inauguration of President Obama. He turned the Treasury over to his comrade in arms, Tim Geithner, and the SICE grad who worked with him from the New York Fed. At SICE, Hank settled into a year of major effort as he set himself the therapeutic task of writing the first draft of history with the acclaimed book about the global financial crisis called On the Brink. I read that book cover to cover in record time. It's a gripping tale narrated in first person of government service when his countrymen depended on his stead steadiness and expertise and openness to risk taking and innovation. It's a hair raising and storing instructing, instructive for our students on so many levels. Hank has had two major cultural, uh, two major intellectual, cultural, and even emotional interests for decades past. They are China, where he is well known and held in high esteem, and conservation, a philanthropic and lifestyle passion that he shares with his wife, Wendy. Indeed, those two C's of China and conservation are linked because Hank and Wendy's commitment and curiosity for the natural world led them to explore a China that most business persons or tourists never see. Hank worked with China's leaders on a variety of environmental issues, and he helped establish China's national parks. Today, our guests will concentrate on China and its role in the global economy, a subject where he has deep experience. Secretary Paulson used his understanding of China to establish the strategic economic dialogue between the two countries, and he played a central role in the creation of the 10-year framework on energy and environment. Hank's principal pursuit these days is as chairman of the Paulson Institute, which he founded earlier this year as an independent center located at the University of Chicago. Reflecting his long and deep commitment the Institute's initial focus is on the United States and China. Very much like Hank himself, it's a place that's focused on action, more do tank than think tank. The Institute aims to help businesses, governments, and NGOs get tangible things done in three areas. Increase cross-investment lending, uh, in, increase cross-investment, which will lead to the creation of jobs, support energy efficiency, develop and deploy the clean energy for sustainable growth, and promote those better environmental practices. And third, promote best business practices on issues of international concern. As Dean, as I close, I would be remiss with our current students 
if I did not know that Mr. Paulson is well-educated and acquired, like so many of you, a taste for public service very early in his career. He is a graduate of Dartmouth College and earned his MBA at Harvard. After business school, he came to Washington, where he worked first in the Pentagon and then in the White House on the Domestic Council under President Richard Nixon. I am sure he did not imagine returning as a key member of the cabinet some 35 years later. From Washington, he went back to hometown Chicago, joined Goldman Sachs, and the rest is history. Hank Paulson, welcome back to SICE. Jessica, thanks so much for that introduction. It's great to be back at SICE. Just terrific to be here. Now, I'm sure you've all noticed that the world economy continues to face some tough challenges. In the United States, banks and capital markets are more stable and better capitalized than they were in 2008. And government regulators have important new authorities that they lacked just three years ago. But we need to restore economic growth, and that challenge is made more difficult because our government has an unsustainable fiscal deficit. What's more, American families have too much debt, and they'll be working to reduce that debt for some time. In Europe, leaders are wrestling with the difficult fiscal condition of several EU members, as well as some complex challenges around the structure of the European Union and they're working to stabilize their banks. There aren't any easy answers here, and the outcome in Europe will affect us all. But this much is clear. Three leading economies, not just two, now confront growing vulnerabilities and thus have special responsibilities. China has cemented its place with the United States in Europe as one of three principal engines of, of the global economy. That means that the world increasingly looks to China as well to help power global growth, to reinvigorate global demand, to rebalance its own economy, and in doing so, help rebalance global investment flows and ultimately help speed up the global recovery. Don't get me wrong, the United States is still the largest and richest economy with a nominal GDP more than twice the size of China's. We're the most important source of trade and investment, and America is a leading innovator, a builder. We have a particular responsibility, working closely with Europe, among others, to find a pathway to recovery from the current crisis. But I'll be blunt. We also need China to get ahead of its growing economic challenges which now threaten to interrupt its truly remarkable record of economic success in recent decades. China's success at sustaining growth, fighting inflation, transitioning from an economic model too dependent on exports and fixed asset investment is closely connected to our own success. Nor can we afford to have all three of the world's principal growth engines facing a crisis simultaneously. Problems in any one of these three economies will make it that much harder for the other two. And every one of today's principal economic challenges can be addressed more effectively if we work with China in complementary ways. We don't always need to work jointly, but we do need to take steps, most individually, sometimes together, that will have the mutually beneficial effect of supporting and sustaining economic growth. And so let me ask this deceptively simple question. Can the United States and China address today's dynamic and considerable economic challenges with the policies we have currently? The answer, I believe, is no. So today I'm going to speak about how to put the American and Chinese economies and by extension, the global economy on a more sustainable footing. The bottom line is this. 
we're missing opportunities to benefit from one another's strengths. For our part, we need a level playing field at, in China for U.S. firms. But we also need more investment from China, which is, after all, sitting at over $3 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, much of it in U.S. dollars, with billions more in the hands of corporations eager to invest here and become global companies. And why wouldn't we want those dollars back? To be invested in productive ways that create American jobs and boost the American economy. That's why we should be more open to Chinese investment. But it's also why Chinese investments would be on a sounder footing here if they help to establish good jobs for American workers. For its part, China wants a fair shot at U.S. markets, too. The Chinese want policy change that will allow better access to technology, for one, and for another, a clearer, more predictable process for investing in the United States. Both nations can help themselves and each other to succeed for mutual benefit. But to do this, I believe we'll need to overhaul the framework that guides our economic relations. How? I've worked with Chinese leaders for nearly two decades as a banker, as treasury secretary, and as a conservationist. And in reflecting on those experiences, I've distilled them into five essential principles. And by the way, these five principles won't just help put our economies on a sounder footing, they can help assure a more complementary footing as well. Principle number one, unlock the promise of capital and cross-investment. For the United States, this means assuring greater openness to Chinese investment, leading to the creation of American jobs. For China, it means undertaking financial reforms now that Beijing might prefer to kick down the road. Principle number two, assure financial markets that are transparent and have strong oversight. For the United States, this means clarifying new regulations and implementing sensible regulatory practices. It also means correcting flawed policies that led to massive consumer debt, a housing bubble, and unsustainable household leverage ratios. For China, it means speeding up financial reforms and strengthening oversight and transparency of non-bank lending. It also means correcting flawed practices that have led to massive producer debt and the misallocation of capital. Principle three, work to strengthen market confidence in our economies. For the United States, this means overcoming the market's lack of confidence in our government's ability to take the necessary steps to protect our economy and keep it competitive. For China, it means overcoming a lack of transparency, not least a dearth of trust in government data and questions about corporate accounting and disclosure. Principle four, free up bilateral trade. For the United States, this argues for moving toward bilateral trade negotiations with China. The global trade round is going nowhere fast. And it also means granting China market economy status on a sector by sector basis. For China, this means getting more serious about three things. First, boosting domestic consumption so that its market becomes a much bigger export destination for U.S. products. Second, expanding market access, including by uh, completing residual WTO commitments. And third, ending an array of discriminatory and anti-competitive practices. Principle five, help technology flow more efficiently and promote innovation. For the United States, this means reforming our outdated export control system while assuring national security. Too often, we restrict trade that would create U.S. jobs and is in our national interest. Separately, the clean energy policy challenge is now so great that we should have a U.S.-China pilot project relying on scientific input and evidence to make it easier for the world's two largest economies, energy consumers, and carbon emitters to use the best technologies. 
For China, it means respecting and enforcing intellectual property commitments. But ultimately, it means making the shift from a consumer to a producer of intellectual property by legitimate means, not using its access to its market as a backdoor to obtain intellectual property developed by others. Only when China innovates, not assimilates technology, will it have enduring incentives to protect it. Now, why do I believe these five principles are so important, and how do we fulfill them? Well, let's start with the first principle, unlocking the promise of capital and cross investment. As Jessica said, I'm a capitalist. I've devoted my career to the principle that world-class capital markets are essential to economic success. Capital markets fund entrepreneurs and businesses of every size and scope. And strong capital markets make average families richer by generating returns on savings. So with China already bumping up against the limits of its existing growth model, financial sector development is essential if the leaders are to realize the goals at the heart of their own blueprint for the future, the 12 five-year plan. That plan aims to ease China's transition into an economy less reliant on investment and exports. So in theory, China should shift from one model to another. Today, China lends money too cheaply to state-owned enterprises, sometimes with little prospect of repayment. Instead, China should ensure that domestic savers, who are often ordinary families, get a fairer return. The lack of good investment options for ordinary Chinese, coupled with inflation and low interest rates on deposit accounts, means that the return on their savings is probably negative. But Chinese companies, especially state-owned enterprises supported by the government, can access cash at rates that are cheaper than what the market should support. This isn't good for the long-term competitiveness of those companies, nor is it good for the efficiency of the Chinese economy. In fact, recent economic events and current global challenges demonstrate the need for even bolder financial reforms as well, like liberalizing the capital account, ensuring and assuring greater flexibility in the exchange rate. I've worked with the Chinese leaders for more than two decades, and they do understand the need for well-developed capital markets. They've also made significant progress in some areas, from restructuring banks to, develop, to, to developing domestic and equity markets, asset managers, and a regulatory system. And Chinese leaders are committed to currency reform because they recognize that capital markets won't function efficiently otherwise. But while the commitments are there, a fragile global economy appears to have eliminated any sense of urgency for such reforms. Friends in Beijing tell me that China has reform fatigue, that China has accomplished so much that the momentum behind reform is fading fast. In my view, China needs to fight through that skepticism. I agree with those in China who are arguing that speeding up reforms will give them a valuable tool to fight inflation and meet other macroeconomic challenges. Here's something else to, ha to consider. What's happening in Europe is China's second warning bill in as many years. China is just too big an economy and still too dependent on exports to ignore what's happening in the very markets whose demand has powered China's growth for so long. And frankly, the present crisis should make financial reforms more not less urgent for China. China has been able to wall off its financial system in the past, during the Asian financial crisis, for example, and again more recently. But can a $6 trillion Chinese economy, deeply integrated into the global system, remain forever immune to what is happening in the $30 trillion economies of Europe and the United States? It cannot. So by putting the right financial tools in place today, China will be better positioned to respond to the current crisis while preventing China's own crisis down the road. China has a choice. It can maintain its intervention in the currency markets, 
or it can speed up the pace of reform toward a market-determined currency. If it does the first, China will continue to accumulate foreign exchange reserves, buying more treasuries and euro bonds, but in doing so, it will become an even bigger funder of the structural deficits in the Europe, Europe and the United States. So instead, it should pursue a market-determined renminbi in an accelerated timetable for capital account liberalization. And that would give Beijing the economic tools it needs to manage a large and increasingly complex economy. I know, convertible, I, I know convertibility in capital account reforms and an open and a more open financial system aren't popular in China. Many in Beijing believe these reforms will make China more, not less vulnerable to future crises. But China can play defense or it can play offense. Or if you prefer, China can continue its single-minded focus on its five-year plan, slowly unrolling reforms, when what it also needs is a five-minute plan of reforms today that would give Beijing the tools to effectively respond to future crises. Remember that in the fall of 2008, China had just one tool to deal with a crisis, massive spending to support growth. And while, yes, that helped cushion the impact of the slower exports as global trade shrank, China's response would be easier if it had the full suite of monetary and financial policies. And that ultimately requires a convertible and floating currency. I do recognize that currency value is a politically sensitive issue in both countries. It's an important trade issue, too. But I have always believed that although currency value is a contributor to our trade deficit with China, it is not the biggest one. We have a trade deficit with the rest of the world. But continued reform of the renminbi is in China's own interest. It is a necessary part of reducing the economic distortions that can create credit risks, bubbles, and domestic imbalances that threaten stability in China. So that's another reason to accelerate efforts to diversify and modernize China's financial system. Open and efficient capital markets go hand in hand with a market-determined currency. And other reforms would be useful as well. Eliminating joint venture requirements on financial service companies. Eliminating remaining geographic descriptions, uh, geographic restrictions on financial service firms. And allowing financial service firms to operate in China as they do in other leading financial service centers subject to domestic regulation. But modernizing China's system isn't the end of this story. To unlock the promise of capital, Americans also need to think hard about our own openness to investment, including investment from a China that is sitting on huge pools of prospective investment capital. Investment flows should be a source of growth and job creation in both countries. But today, those flows are largely one way, from the United States to China. U.S. government statistics show that in 2010, Chinese FDI stock in the U.S. was $5.9 billion, just about one-tenth of the 50 billion of U.S. FDI stock in China. That number needs to grow more and faster to help leverage Chinese capital to create and sustain American jobs. Many Americans react negatively to Chinese investment, and for that matter, to any foreign investment. Even though foreign direct investment is, in my judgment, the ultimate vote of confidence in our system. FDI creates good jobs in the United States. 5.6 million, including over 2 million in manufacturing. And the average salary of these jobs is 33% higher than the national average. But the U.S. government estimates that affiliates, estimates that affiliates of Chinese firms in the U.S employed little more than 4,000 Americans in 2009. So there's plenty of room to grow, not least because Chinese companies have been reluctant to invest, judging that they won't be welcomed here, or because they don't understand the investment process. There's a lesson here. Chinese leads the world in foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. 
with $1.14 trillion. But it would strengthen our economic relations if China put more of those dollars to work at higher return investments that create jobs in the United States. Of course, we'll need to maintain an environment that's open to investment from all countries. We need, we need to make sure that the process for investing here is clear, open, and fair. When I was Treasury Secretary, we streamlined the CFIUS process to ensure that the rules for investing here would be as clear and fair as possible. But five years have passed, so the administration should update its examples and guidelines for successful CFIUS review, drawing on experience from the first few years of the new law. We should publish more and clearer illustrative examples of investments that have passed or failed the new review process helping to demystify CFIUS and to further clarify how it works. And since China's state-owned enterprises also want to invest here, we'll need a process to divine principles for their outbound investment, like the Santiago principles developed for sovereign wealth funds. Discussion of such principles is underway right now in two forums, OECD and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But China isn't a principal in either group. So I encourage our governments to seek ad hoc mechanisms to involve Beijing in the discussions. And finally, we need to finalize a bilateral investment treaty. How can we have a bit with Moldova, Moldovia and Kyrgyzstan, but not have a treaty in place to protect U investments, U.S. investments in China? China has signed 120 investment treaties, including with our closest economic partners, Japan, Germany, and Britain. And some of those give foreign investors strong protections, including the option to resort to binding international arbitration for investment disputes. Shouldn't we want that for our companies? Now consider the second principle. We need efficient and transparent markets with strong oversight. Well-functioning markets get money to where it is needed, but they also prevent financial systems from creating hidden excesses or bubbles, which are counterproductive and can be destabilizing. And so this principle requires first that we change incentives that have led to bad behaviors. In the United States, government policies help to fuel the credit and housing bubble and unsustainable household leverage ratios. Indeed, in the run-up to the crisis, Household debt as a percentage of an American family's disposable income more than doubled from historical levels. And households still have a long way to go to pay down their debt, reach a sustainable level, and start spending again to support growth. But the crisis also demonstrated in very brutal ways the dangers of insufficient transparency or oversight in credit default swaps, securitization, and the repo market. And of course, it exposed flawed mortgage lending practices, inadequate capital and liquidity, deficient risk management by our banks, as well as serious problems in our credit rating agencies. There's more to be done to clarify new regulations and, submit, excuse me, and implement sensible regulatory practices. But there's some good news here, because we've moved quickly to address problems in this part of our financial system. And the American sovereign injected capital into our banks, unfreezing credit and bolstering confidence. In the latter sense, China is like the United States in that no one questions whether the sovereign is strong enough to stabilize the banks. But assuring oversight of China's non-banking lending is going to be a challenge. In the aftermath of Beijing's mammoth 2009 bank lending stimulus, the country is facing understandable and difficult side effects, not least inflation. And these challenges are hard to deal with for two reasons. First, with official intervention leading to an artificially weak currency, the central bank has been denied a useful monetary tool to fight inflation. Second, without sufficient oversight of non-bank lending, it is more difficult for Chinese policymakers to effectively tighten liquidity. And so this so-called shadow lending is also problematic because it is not transparent 
and generates credit risks and potentially bubbles. In raising this, I don't want to minimize the progress China has made. It's remarkable, for example, that China's banks, which were practically defunct 10 years ago, have come so far that they could serve as a vehicle through which Beijing in injected stimulus lending into the economy in 2009. That was a critical step for sustaining growth in China, and it became an engine of growth benefiting the, the entire world. For China's banks then, as with all state-owned enterprises, the next step is to, or the next challenge is to run them increasingly as commercial enterprises. And for the financial system more broadly, assuring transparency and oversight will mean dealing, among other things, with problems of unapproved non-bank lending. Such lending poses an important risk to the Chinese economy because it has the same macroeconomic impact as lending from China's big banks, but without the same level of transparency and oversight. China is awash in unregulated capital. Everyone is lending, not just banks, but asset management companies, local government investment vehicles, and even state-owned enterprises. Some economists argue that informal lending was responsible for as, 40, for as much as 40% of new credit creation in 2010 and the first half of 2011. And much of that appears to be company-to-company -company lending. At least one estimate I've seen puts this intercompany loans at 4 trillion RMB outstanding at the end of uh, 2010. That's more than $600 billion, nearly doubling from the end of 2008. Now, these loans aren't esoteric instruments like the securities that help create credit risks in the United States. And they're filling an important gap by putting capital into the hands of those, such as private firms, that cannot easily get it from China's big state banks, which lend disproportionately to state-owned enterprises. But recent reports of defaults in Wenzhou demonstrate the risks inherent in these unauthorized loans. Beyond these questions of oversight, Chinese investors also need a variety of well-regulated products in which to invest. So China needs financial innovation and liberalization but it needs strong financial oversight and more transparency, too. The third principle, work in complementary ways to strengthen market confidence. And by that, I mean bolstering trust across our two financial systems while committing to policies that increase confidence in our government's respective economic choices. I've talked a lot about transparency today because it's a lifeblood of confidence, and good markets. Markets are built on trust. Transparency fosters it. A lack of transparency erodes it. Look at the U.S. experience. In the crisis of 2007 and 2008, the markets lost confidence in mortgage securitizations, and perhaps all securitizations because they were so complex. Risks were impossible to understand. Credit ratings lost their meaning. Credit rating agencies lost their credibility, particularly with regard to securitized products. And one institution after another said they were healthy right up until they weren't and they failed. In the U.S., we're still working hard to restore that lost trust. But assuring trust is a challenge for China, too. Here's an example. Recently, outright fraud in a number of Chinese companies that were backdoor listed in the United States has morphed into concerns about the transparency of Chinese banks. Meanwhile, everyone knows China's economy is growing rapidly, but there's less confidence in Chinese economic data. So to restore trust, Beijing needs to rectify problems with government and corporate accounting and disclosure. Then there's a second ingredient of, of bolstering market confidence. We need a stronger government commitment to addressing our respective economic challenges. For China, that means deepening its commitment not just to growth, but also to rebalancing and thus to sustainable growth. And we Americans have difficult decisions to make, too. We must forge a political consensus to tackle our fiscal deficit, and we need fundamental reforms to restore our competitiveness 
including but not limited to entitlements, taxes, immigration, housing, education and training, energy and our tort system. Taking action requires bipartisan cooperation and compromise. We're a rich country, and if we act soon, we can deal with our fiscal deficit and our other economic challenges with shared sacrifice, but without any segment of our society having to sacrifice too much. The longer we wait, the more painful the medicine will be, and if we wait too long, the market will force it upon us. We need to free up and rebalance trade. That's the fourth principle. Trade has benefited and continues to benefit both the United States and China. And at this moment of greatest economic challenge, we need more, not less of it. And we need fewer barriers, not more hurdles. Indeed, this year marks the 10th anniversary of China's accession to the WTO. Much has been achieved, but frankly, trade with China should be a more important source of economic growth in the United States. The scope and scale of our bilateral trade fall far below their potential. Our first challenge is to rebalance our economics and thus our trade flows. Excuse me, rebalance our economies and thus our trade flows. China saves too much, produces too much, sells too much to us and to others, and consumes too little on its own. The U.S. saves too little, consumes too much, and would like to produce more and to sell more of what we produce to China. So why are we falling short? Well, we need to understand first that there's good news about trade. U.S. exports to China have nearly quintupled since China entered the WTO 10 years ago to almost 100 billion in 2010. Our exports have grown more quickly than our imports from China. And China is our fastest growing export market. Consider this. When U.S. exports as a whole dropped by almost 18% in 2009 during the financial crisis, our exports to China dropped by less than 1%. That's a demonstration of China's potential to become a demand driver for U.S. products over the long haul. And yet, our trade deficit with China has widened over the past 10 years. So we must pr press harder for market access for American goods and service. And in doing so, even as we applaud China's remarkable growth, which has lifted millions out of poverty, it is worth asking our Chinese friends what they think China's growth trajectory would have been if its major trading partners had employed the same practices that China does. We'll need to press hard for changes to China's regulatory framework. And we must aggressively enforce our existing trade agreements with China. American companies can't, for example, be expected to trade, to, excuse me, transfer proprietary technologies when China sets unfair domestic content rules. No one has worked harder than I to open Chinese markets and fight for a level playing field for US firms. But I'm also a free trader. Ultimately, I believe that what we most need is an affirmative agenda to enlarge the entire pie. So with the Doha round going nowhere, that means beginning bilateral negotiations with China and the most important sectors, including clean energy technology, and seeking to include China in broader talks with, with groups of like-minded countries as well. We should work within the WTO framework. But much as we did with Japan in the 1990s, we should also aim to identify and resolve structural impediments that hinder trade and contribute to bilateral and global imbalances. Another useful step would be, to be, would be to begin immediately granting China market economy status on a sector by sector basis. This will allow China to be recognized for the strides its economy has made these past 10 years, but it will also force China to face tougher requirements in opening its markets. China is still not a market economy in some ways. It, retrained, it, it, it retains legacies of central planning, industrial policy, and state control. But there are parts of China's economy that function according to market economy rules. China's small and medium-sized enterprises, for example, including many exporters, 
are largely excluded from the realm of state uh, backed loans and input subsidies. So to encourage China to move in the right direction, we should recognize progress with an expectation that all players in sectors granted market economy status act on commercial principles. Here's the fifth and final principle. We all want technology to flow more efficiently in areas that are of mutual benefit. And ultimately, we'll want both sides to promote innovation so that China moves beyond merely assimilating technology developed by others and U.S. intellectual property is respected and protected. Americans want to do this, but in a way that protects our national security and intellectual property rights, assures our competitiveness, and leads to more jobs and exports. There is currently an effort underway in the U.S. government to reform and streamline an outdated and cumbersome export control bureaucracy. I applaud this initiative, but it seems to have lost steam. It should be completed as soon as possible. And there's also good reason to experiment in areas that are decidedly in our national interest, like helping China meet certain energy and environmental goals. Why? Well, China has a, an economy high in energy intensity, but low in energy efficiency. And China's leaders have committed in the 12 five-year plan to changes aimed at fostering efficiency, diversifying resources, and reducing carbon intensity. If China doesn't meet these goals, then the whole world, including the United States, will pay the price. So we should be willing to export innovative technology that can help China reduce its energy consumption and power cleaner growth into the future. But we can't do that meaningfully if China fails to respect and enforce intellectual property rights. Beijing needs to make its commitment in this area real. And it needs to change a system that has too often looked the other way or been complicit in intellectual property theft. We'll also need enhanced end user programs with China to ensure that our technology exports are being used as intended and not in ways that threaten our national security. And separately, we need to listen to the best scientific advice available as we seek to overcome pressing environmental challenges. So I propose a pilot project with China, which would convene a team of technical experts from both countries to focus on existing and emerging clean energy technologies. Their expert input could help guide officials in both countries, but it would also be useful as the U.S. weighs how to expedite the licensing process. Over the long term, we want China to become more of a technology innovator not just because it could lead to breakthroughs that will be of public benefit, but also because it will change incentives in China to protect the fruits of its labor. A China that consumes rather than produces intellectual property will never share the underlying approach to intellectual property protection that has developed in innovative economies. We're approaching a presidential election while well, China approaches its own political succession. And jobs and growth are the number one issue in both countries. These five principles and the policy recommendations associated with them are intended to help our economies assure growth and expand opportunity. They'll require China to reform, perhaps at a faster pace than its leaders are comfortable with. But I believe reforming too slowly now poses a greater risk to China's economic stability than many in China believe. For our part, they require the restoration of our own economy and addressing our fiscal deficit and growth outlook. And that can only be achieved through fundamental reforms based on bipartisan cooperation. The era of overconsumption in the United States has gone forever. And with hindsight, we can see that like all bubbles, it wasn't sustainable. As American families repair their balance sheets, consumer spending won't lead growth as it has in the past. But I have an abiding faith in the resilience of the U.S. economy. We have by far the world's richest, largest economies. And although we face significant problems, the challenges we face are less daunting than those confronting China and virtually every other major nation. And our problems 
are of our own making. Our continued leadership will be a function of our ability to make required policy adjustments. It is our cho choices that matter most as we seek to rem remain globally competitive and economically strong. Uh, thank you. known that we were in for that much of a treat, I would have arranged an honorary degree. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Secretary Paulson has kindly agreed to take some questions. We have a big audience. We have an overflow audience. What we'd ask you to do, and especially if anybody still has a cell phone on, turn those off, please, is uh, when you're called on, ask a question, one question. If you give him two, he'll choose his own. Um, and give us your name and an affiliation, either as a student or if you're working elsewhere. So please, let's see a show of hands and we'll start the questions. We'll start for the students soon, maybe back there. Please stand and speak into the microphone so we can hear you. Uh, this is Xu Ling from the Chinese Media Net. My question is regarding the China currency bill. Um, uh, someone in 2005 has suggested that Chinese currency uh, appreciate by 27.5%, um, and it has by uh, uh, since then appreciated by 30%, but U.S. is still yet to be recovered from the financial crisis, and the employment rate is, not, uh, is still not satisfactory. Um, do you think that the China bill, uh, the China currency bill, is well justified, and do you think that uh, um, the idea of this uh, China currency bill is formed in part to avoid the responsibilities of the U.S. financial system and to let, let China take the blame? Thank you. Okay, well, that's, that's several questions, but I will we'll, uh, try to answer them all. Uh, first of all, I believe, as, as you can see from my speech, that very strongly that it's in China's best interest to reform and move to a market-determined currency that reflects economic conditions. And that will help China make the transition they need to make to a, an economy with more consumption where the benefits are spread more broadly. It'll help them fight inflation. So it's in China's best interest. And I think that is the right tack to take. Because getting to the currency bill, um, that I don't believe that the right approach, it's an effective approach for one sovereign nation to, 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 to essentially try to dictate to another and then say, if you don't do this, I'm going to threaten you with a punishment. I don't think that would be very effective someone dealing with the United States. I don't think we'd react very well to someone uh, telling us what they would, uh, how they would uh, punish us if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, change. Uh, I think that the approach that I tried to get to in my speech is an approach that will, uh, that will be helpful to all Americans. And I, I don't think a, an approach that could lead to a trade w war and would hurt Americans is the right way to go. I think we sort of need an affirmative agenda here uh, to enlarge the pie. But don't get me wrong. Uh, I very much believe that uh, China should be moving to a market-determined uh, currency. And uh, you know, ch China is a, it, it's, it's a positive, it, it, China is an anomaly. It's, it's, it's a positive anomaly, but Never in the history of the world have we had an economic power that's still a developing country, and or have have a, a country that is so integrated into the global economic system in terms of trades and goods and services, but not in terms of financial markets and currency. So I think it's in all of our interest for China to speed up and uh, their, their reform. But I don't think that the uh, currency legislation is, 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 in my judgment, the right way to go about it. Okay. 
I'm sorry, it was here, Sven. Thank you so much, Secretary Paulson, and congratulations on your, the launch of the new center. I'm Steve Clemens with The Atlantic. China plans to urbanize about 400 more million people in 20 years, and that'll be the largest economic event in mankind's history. And it raises the question that in the partnership you talk about, how can the West, how can America and the West continue to define in any way kind of global economic gravity? Because China is essentially making the global weather in that. And it, and it, and it fundamentally raises the question that while partnership sounds great, the leverage points that we have in the West seem to me to be diminishing. And I'd love to hear how you would balance that out. Well, first of all, uh, I would think, and, and, and this is a little bit different, I'm going to get to your question in a minute, but I, I, I think, again, we are by far the world's largest, richest economy. No doubt about that. And I do believe that our, you know, our ability to, to maintain our, our, our status globally and our, and our strength in, 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 as a nation is rooted in our economic strength. I think it is with every nation. So I think over time, uh, we, we certainly are going to need to take steps to, to restore and, you know, our, our competitiveness. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly uh, have always been an advocate for being, you know, strong uh, militarily, economically, diplomatically, etc. Now, let's get to, 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 to what's going on in China. There's a this is going to be a huge challenge for China and for the rest of the world because, you know, in some ways we've given China a flawed model. There aren't enough resources in the world for 1.3 billion Chinese to live the way we live in the United States. And so they are working hard to deal with the challenge that you've uh, th that you've laid out. How do they come up with new growth models? How do they come up with new energy models? Um, how, how do they make this, this work? And my experience in China has been that this doesn't need to be combative. The great thing about China's leaders and the people, they're looking everywhere they can find for the best models, the best way to tackle their problems. And I think, you know, our, if we don't engage, shame on us, because uh, there's no way, you know, you just talk about something like climate. Uh, no matter what we do in this country, and unless we develop new alternative sources of clean technology that can be deployed in scale in the developing world in a cost-effective manner, we're not going to get there. Take one from this side. Yes, please. Uh, it was here, yeah. Hold on. And we'll come to you later. Hi, uh, Connor Foley. I'm a second year SAIS student uh, concentrating in China. Um, I'm kind of curious, you've outlined kind of the promise of markets for China, but there's a number of challenges or chicken and the egg type problems in opening up the capital account and stabilizing the financial system. And since the Asian financial crisis, a number of Asian countries have kind of learned the lesson of self-insuring. That's part of the reason why we've had these huge accumulations of foreign right. reserves. And China today has been using them through central Huijin to capitalize their banking system. So how does China send those abroad to the United States while it's trying to use them to create the stability in its own financial system? And how, going forward, is it going to be able to uh, be confident in opening up its capital account, given the weakness of its financial system, the past experience of other countries, and the volatility that still exists in the global financial system? Well, th that's what, th that's the $64,000 question, as we used to say when I, when I was your age. And th th that is, Listen, it was funny, but not that funny. <laughs> but, but the, uh, but I guess in an economic speech, anything's funny, right? So, but after, but that's what I tried to 
re really address in my speech because I think that um, that particularly after the financial crisis, well, to step back, there is no doubt that the principles that we are espousing here uh, are, are harder to sell after the financial crisis. As my counterpart in the SED, Wang Shishong, said to me, you know, Hank, I used to listen carefully to you, but now you were my teacher, but maybe my teacher doesn't seem so wise <laughs> after, <laughs> after, after, after the problems you have. And so what, what I always try to explain is you should be careful what lessons you take away. We made a lot of mistakes, and we can learn from, from those mistakes. But what I tried to say in my, my speech is I don't believe that any country that is big and integrated into the global system as China is can defy the economic you know, laws of gravity and, that, um, and wall themselves off, uh, be as integrated in terms of trade and, 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 and not be integrated in terms of markets and currency and capital account. And so, as you've rightly said, I mean, that's why I, I pushed very hard for opening up financial markets when I was at, to greater competition when I was a Treasury Secretary. And I didn't do it because I came from Wall Street and I wanted to do a favor to Wall Street. I did it because I understood that for China to get where they needed to get, they had to have more, better developed, more efficient, mature capital markets before they could before they could uh, take the next step. And I still think they need to do that. And m my own judgment is now more than ever that their economy is so large and so complex and the global economy has got so many challenges. I think that they're just, there's more risk to China in going too slow than there would be in going too fast. And to understand the Chinese, you just need to understand the lens they're going to look through is stability. And they're going to take the choice that they think gives them the greatest stability. And so far, what they've done, they've looked at it. You know, it worked during the, the, uh, the Asian crisis. They were largely walled off. They've been largely walled off to, to some extent during, during this crisis. But again, as, as I said, how long can a $6 trillion economy stay walled off from the U.S. and Europe? And I think they're going to need to speed up the process. But that's a case that's got to be made, and I tried to begin making it in my speech. Let's take the other one back there, and then we'll move to this side. Hi, I'm Christopher Goins. I'm with Cybercast News Service. Um, Mr. Paulson, uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program allocated up to $700, $700 billion to provide stability. Only about $438 billion of this went to institutions. We are now informed that the Federal Reserve issued $16 trillion in credit to banks. How did, it, how did it do this without revealing this on its balance sheet? Well, I'm not here to answer questions for the Fed. And the, ben, ben Bernanke does a good job of that. But I, what, what I will say, I think what the American people should be asking is, how can we thank the Fed for being as successful as they were at preventing a collapse of our financial system? And, and, and everything I've read leads me to believe that those dollars are coming back. So this was, these were investments that were made to protect the American people. It wasn't made for Wall Street or for the banks. It was to, to prevent a catastrophe. And so I think it has been managed uh, very well in terms of the uh, the impact uh, th that it's prevented. Great. Okay, we're going to start. I don't know if there's anyone back there, but here we go. Oh, two. Two right. Uh, Hank, congratulations on your institute. A uh, very important initiative. My name is Mike Italiano, CEO of Capital Markets Partnership. Hank, uh, Neil Cash Carey was our representative from Treasury when you were secretary. Uh, Wall Street due diligence uh, released at the New York Stock Exchange documented with national statistically valid data that green buildings are more profitable, less risky, and preferred by investors. 
and green building securities will create a trillion dollar private sector stimulus, 8 million new jobs, 400 billion in new wages, and a 20, million, a 20 year business model for the investment banks. Um, most importantly, and finally, it documented that these securities will stop dangerous climate change from going irreversible and unmanageable in the next five years, and the resulting ongoing systemic financial market risks already apparent in the insurance government, agricultural, fisheries, and forestry sector. Uh, U.S. started green buildings in the burgeoning uh, green building market in China, and my question is the uh, investment bank CEOs who were working diligently to launch these securities all got fired because of the credit crisis. And do you have any thoughts on how to get their attention again at the banks? Well, I, uh, you know, I'm not spending uh, a lot of time with banks these days. And, um, but I think what you really need to ask is not so much, I think you can assume that banks will be involved when there's a a, a, a real demand and there's the uh, proper incentives. And so when, when we start looking at green buildings or a whole series of other uh, uh, in, environmentally efficient uh, uh, products, I think what you need to do is let's just start with government policies. I think you need proper government policies. And I think that uh, companies need to hear from their investors, from their customers, from their employers. And I, I think that's why most major uh, companies do, do the sorts of things they do when they do positive things that have a, a beneficial impact on the environment. They think it's good business. And I think that, uh, uh, and, and I think markets develop when there's sort of a demand and there are investors and clients there that want them. I don't think you're, you're going to find banks trying to create a market if there's not a, if, if there's not a basis for it. Can I do a follow-up on that one and ask you about the role of mayors uh, in this? I think I may recall correctly or not that, um, that in New York City when they did their environmental study, they found that buildings were actually uh, the major environmental issue in terms of, uh, yep. uh, of change. And so I'm wondering whether the place to start is not the bankers with supply, but the cities with uh, demand, and not going federal, but starting with the major cities. Well, well uh, Jessica, I, I think you're right in that a lot of the work we're going to do with the Institute is going to be at the subnational level with mayors and governors in both countries. Because I think, first of all, there you find uh, the most support for investment, uh, cross investment, jobs and growth. And that's where it really can, they've got flexibility to do more in, in terms of environmental practices. And there's a, a, a greater, there's a, there's a real demand for their, for their constituents. So I think so much of what needs to be done, and, 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 and this is why, you know, there was an earlier question about uh, China and urbanization, and, you know, the, the work that I've done in China or in Latin America or just about anywhere where the population is growing quickly, that it's so important to get there early it, 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 as, as a city is, is, is taking root because there are so many mistakes that it can be avoided if, if, if you do it early, and it's very hard to correct. But yeah, I think a lot of the, uh, 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 with regard to the, the, the green buildings and, uh, and environmental practices, a lot of that impetus comes from the city level. We have time for one last question. Are there any SICE students? I see Jason over there. Spencer, you wanna close and it with a can I Can I ask you to, to do, Jason, thank you so much, do it quickly, but also Jim Mann, whom okay. we overlooked. Sure. We'll do two. Okay, sure. Hi, Secretary Paulson. I'm uh, Jason Lognane, second year student at SICE and a former employee of yours at Goldman. Uh, so thanks for coming back. I'm sure you remember me. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, in, um, in the next 12 months in the lead up to the election, you know, given the, the ease of scoring partisan points by bashing China for taking away American jobs, whether you anticipate anything progressive happening before that time and 
following the election if you think we'll have a better chance of greater integration under a second Obama administration or under a Republican president. Well, Thanks. I, I would say this, that elections are about choices. And the voters, you know, I don't care whether it's either party, voters respond to, or, or, or elected officials respond to the, to, to the voters that put, put them there. So my own judgment is, although I don't want to sound without hope, and I'm still hoping that the super committee is going to positively surprise us all with some of the things they're going to do before the election. And even if it's only $1.5 trillion, and again, that's not a heavy lift over 10 years on a $40 trillion budget, at least it's a, a deficit, it's at least a, at least a start. So, but, but my, my own view is that we're going to have a better chance after the election because what voters are going to have to do, they're going to have to send a message. And the message, in my judgment, the right message is not let's go change government or let's just cut spending. Cutting spending is, is, is quite important. It's necessary but not sufficient. Voters are going to have to... To, to want fundamental reform. And that takes bipartisan cooperation and compromise, as I said. And that's the hope, that's what we need to make us competitive. And when you look at this, you know, my speech was, I, I mentioned a number of areas where we really need this. And to make real progress in the trade area, um, I think it's gonna be easier to get some things done after the election. And let's not forget, China's got their own you know, change in government, which which is 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 also a a, a process where there's 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 a fair amount of scrutiny and it's and uh, great attention to, to to public sentiment. So I think it'll be it'll be easier to do some of the, these things afterwards, but that's a long time to wait, and it's rather discouraging. So I think we've got to uh, got to hope for any progress we can get. Last question, Jim Mann, uh, professor of science. Um, Jim Mann, author here at SICE. I want to ask you about the subtle problem of low expectations that we have and that China encourages us to have sometimes. On, the, on trade, uh, it's true, as you say, that our exports have written, risen in percentage terms um, more than uh, China's exports to the United States. But that's against a framework where China's exports are many, many multiples higher than our exports to China. So the percentages right. uh, uh, have, are cast in a different light there. On uh, currency values, um, we're in a situation where, um, as you say, the current currency is quite a bit in our um, estimation, uh, quite a bit undervalued. Um, so that over the past four or five years, um, they have made um, some small responses and they get treated as, you know, as more than really they are and not what they need to be. Um, so do we look at China with too low expectations of what they can and should do? Well, I, I sure, uh, maybe I failed with my speech here because I sure hoped to set the bar high and, and, and set some high expectations. And that, um, and, and I think that's really what we, what, what we need to do. We, we need to, and I'm not, uh, anyone that knows me, I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I, I fight pretty hard, and, uh, and I'm for uh, creating more opportunities, but I think there's a right way to go about it. And, uh, none of our expectations are going to be met if the Chinese economy doesn't uh, continue to grow. And so I, I think maybe the first place to set our high expectations, when you start off on low expectations, I thought you were talking about the U.S. government <laughs> there for a minute, because I think we need to set the bar, you know, and, and we really are going to need some strong, uh, leadership on these economic issues and, uh, you know, and, and, and bipartisan major effort here in Washington because no matter what China does or doesn't do, 
uh, we, we've got our work set out for us, and we've got to do that. And then in terms of China, I think that is we, we need to have high expectations, and we need to be clear about what we want. And I think a lot of this, it's so easy to sink into the, when you look at U.S. China, into all of the myriad issues you have on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than stepping back and having a framework. And what I try to say is let's have a framework to prioritize and say what are the really important things we should be pushing for and then working to get progress. But I think we take our eye off the ball and get all tied up in things that aren't really going to make as big a difference. And so the, um, so, so that's really what, what I tried to get to. But I, I, I sort of un understand your, your, your comment and your, your frustration. So as we conclude, let me say that Hank Paulson made his impact in New York and he made his impact in Washington, but he left his heart in Chicago. <laughs> so our compliments to the University of Chicago, which now has the Paulson Institute, and all we can hope is that SICE will be home away from home. Thank you very he much. Was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.